So welcome, welcome, welcome to the Baja Four uh, first conversation around death and dignity. We are really, really lucky to have a special guest speaker with us today, Gary Wetterspawn, who's going to be talking to us um, from Final Exit Network. And this is co-hosted by the Baja Four. We're lucky to have two of our other congregations formally represented here um, and the other one in spirit, unless there's a Borderlands person here that I don't know. Uh, but welcoming Jamili Omar, the Director of Lifespan Faith uh, Development over at UCT, and also the person holding a lot of our Lifespan Faith Development for the Baja Four. We are grateful to you at Mountain Vista for holding our community through all of this. Uh, and then the Reverend Tina Squire, infamous from Sky Island, um, who also brings a lot of experience with this as a chaplain in her other day job. <laughs> Tina, Tina actually has two jobs. She's a minister, but she also spends much of her time um, at bedside of people who are dying and brings a lot of love and compassion to the conversation. So both Jamili and Tina are, we're all kind of in this conversation together. They're going to jump in. They're going to offer ideas and questions. And so will all of you. Gary is passionate about um, this not being just the Gary talking show. Gary does not want to be the Gary talking show. He's going to want your questions in the chat or interruptions, your interruptions are welcome. And if he feels like he needs to keep moving, he has no problem telling us that he needs to keep moving. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Uh, Gary, I wanna give a little kind of formal introduction to you. He's an active supporter of the Death with Dignity movement for a long time, at least as long as I've been alive, since the 1980s <laughs> with the Hemlock Society. And he's a board member of Final Exit Network. I know. Final Exit Network has been an organization that some of you have all relied on uh, to get more information and access to information with Death with Dignity. And Final Exit Network is one of the leading organizations on the right to die. So he's also involved in other kinds of uh, organizations that are related or spun off. He's a member of Compassion and Choices uh, is another version and, and Exit International. And Gary, you've been in this as lifelong um, from what I understand and really this the choice to die the right to die on your own terms has been a real compelling piece of your own life so thank you for coming today to give us the introduction and bring us into the conversation and help us get started and i'll turn it over to you great well thank you sam may i call you sam <laughs> okay great well it might be helpful uh, i'm a uu um and um uh i'm really proud to be a UU in terms of our stance with regard to death with dignity. That'll be something we'll talk about as we go forward. But personally and professionally, um, I left this country, oh, in uh, mid 60s, uh, to go overseas to uh, work with the Peace Corps. And I didn't really get back until uh, the early 70s. Spent about 12 years running the Peace Corps in different countries. And our focus of most of our programs that we did in these countries was um, basic human rights and the right to choose is one of those. And after all those years, and I lived and worked in countries where um, there wasn't a really a taboo death uh, issue like we have in the States so much. Um, uh, I can tell you some really fun and interesting stories where um, uh, death is actually celebrated and the and the veil between the living and the dying is super super thin and uh, and uh, these different cultures and i became very much kind of like a, um, a, a cross-cultural uh, adventurer particularly as with the, with regard to how people relate to this idea of mortality and what it means. And so I came back to my own country and uh, I encountered, I had forgotten, I guess, how, mm. how awkward we are about even talking about death. And, and uh, um, I uh, decided that maybe I should become more active as, a, as an advocate for making this, taking this out of the closet and helping people gain options and to know all the options that they have in order to, as you said, uh, Sam, end life on their own terms. You know, it's a matter of choice, really. Uh, 
choice of uh, whether you bring a life into the world, choice of who you love, choice, you know, at the end of life, it's your life. So choice is a great big issue, and we'll be talking a lot about that. And that's the door I came in through. Many of my colleagues, and we're all volunteers, uh, probably about 120 volunteers, uh, physicians, hospice chaplains, uh, a medical ethicists, uh, counselors, all of us are giving our time to this cause. No one gets paid except one uh, um, executive director who kind of runs the business, you know, the uh, ad admin. The rest of us are doing this because it's a, a passion with us. Now, I came in through that door from my Peace Corps and early civil rights stuff in the States in the 60s. But many of my colleagues, I would say the majority of them, came into FAN to be volunteers and work uh, on this on these topics um, through the compassion door. The, 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 the feeling of the way we deal with death and dying in this country, uh, we, wouldn't we wouldn't have flicked on our animals, put it that way. And so the compassion is what brings many of these people in uh, to Final Exit Network. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I just want to lay that on the table, okay? Uh, I guess it's time, uh, Jamil, to show the first slide, maybe? Oh, good job. She, she edited this at, uh, uh, two minutes ago. Let's see. Very good. Okay, a good death. That's kind of the theme. It's time to think about it. We're not getting any younger. I, I'm 81, and this is a, a topic that's looming more and more important to me and my loved ones. Uh, next slide. Okay. We all hope to have a, 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 a good death as a capstone of a good life, right? That's the best. That's, that's the first prize. Uh, and what is a good death? And we have to kind of think about it. But we feel we also, we have a right to it, by golly, it's our own lives. So uh, uh, a good death would certainly involve matter of self-determination. Next slide. So uh, our title is Death with Dignity. And that's what many of these uh, laws around the country were originally titled Death with Dignity Laws. And dignity is a big, big part of it. Um, dignity includes having your uh, personal uh, autonomy and your uh, um, be, be respected and, and, and not being overridden as you become more vulnerable and more uh, dependent on others. It's a natural progression. So we get closer to the end. Uh, other people are starting to uh, feel like maybe they have a right to, to uh, say what happens to us. But uh, that is not what I would call dignity. Our dignity includes uh, choice. Next slide. Okay. We, you, use are the first and so far only religious body in the United States to affirm the right to die on our own terms. Uh, we voted on that, we passed it, and it's still uh, UU policy. And if you read the entire resolution, it goes on to say that, uh, that we UUs should be out uh, advocating for this right, and we should be teaming up with other organizations that are doing so. Well, back in 1988, we at Hemlock were the only game in town. We, uh, we brought this whole movement, I uh, started about that time, 1984 actually. So at that point, we were already natural allies. And uh, so what we're gonna do uh, here is entirely appropriate. We're already uh, uh, on the same team, I believe. Um, <coughs> and I will give you a chance to talk, don't worry. Uh, the next slide is from my favorite uh, UU uh, theologian. Do, do you know Forrest uh, Church? I'm sure that those of you who have been, you know, 
through theological studies. And the key word here, I love this uh, um, uh, quote, uh, a key word for me is um, natural. Death is a natural phenomenon. It's un unavoidable. Uh, it's as in, uh, it should be as beautiful and, and, uh, and natural and accepted as birth. So just two bookends to the same, same life uh, process. And then here's that word again, dignity. It'll be coming up over and over again. Uh, but I really love this and I hope that uh, we use it a lot when we talk to non-UU uh, groups as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, we have seven, um, uh, what do we call them? Principles, right? And there, here are three of them. And they are exactly the same as uh, uh, they're included also independently uh, in uh, Final Exit Network's guiding principles. You can check that online. So uh, uh, it seems to me that we're entirely on the same page. Okay. So, oh, it's in 1980. Uh, good life, again, a good death. Uh, Hemlock Society was uh, formed by Derek Humphrey and uh, Faye Gersh and a few other people. And they're still, they're still alive and they're still on our advisory council. So they haven't given up yet and they uh, uh, are there to, to continue to inspire us. Next slide. Next slide is the book, this book, um, Final Exit Network. Uh, Derek it was a uh, journalist, fairly, fairly well-known journalist in the UK. And his wife, uh, Jane, uh, had a very uh, difficult death with cancer, very, very painful. Pain control wasn't so good back in those days. And she pleaded with him and he finally helped her uh, have a peaceful, uh, the euphemism that we have in, in the movement is uh, self-deliverance. And then he wrote it up as a book called Jane's Way. It might be interesting if you're interested in the history of this entire movement. And that brought him a lot of notoriety. And it, uh, so much so, I think that he had to move to the States and he came to the US and he wrote this book, which is the first, it was a bestseller for uh, 30, 40 uh, weeks on, on the New York Times list. It's now up to its, uh, I think, uh, third edition, uh, heart in our, its uh, paperback, and about fifth uh, as an ebook online. Still, you can still get it. It's still the main manual uh, for do-it-yourselfers, people who want to actually die on their own terms. This is a how-to book. That's what caused all the controversy, the practicalities of self-deliverance and assisted suicide in the dying. There's a chapter in there that is kind of a how-to, and that was really outrageous at the time, but it empowered people. Um, uh, Final Exit Network uh, has never gotten a dime from the sale of this book. Um, all of our support comes from donors and volunteers like myself, um, and uh, all the uh, uh, royalties and so on from Derek's book goes to uh, support the research that he is still trying to conduct and so on. Um, if you're going to get this, I, I recommend you get this book if you haven't already read it, but be sure it's at least uh, edition three, because the uh, practicalities and the technology has changed over the years. Um, another good book, as long as I'm talking books, uh, is a little um, more, um, how can I say, not so he heavy, a little more accessible, is called How to Get the Death You Want. 
It's, it's uh, written by John Abraham. He's a Episcopal priest and a, uh, a specialist in, in um, uh, this whole question of dying. He's, that's his professional career. And he happens to live in, in, in Tucson, um, if you want to check it out. So that's another good book, How to Get the Death You Like, as a resource. Maybe, you, maybe we can put that in the chat book if people are interested. Uh, uh, in, the, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, oh, good. John's going to be on the show. Excellent. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a brief history. Hemlock Society is the origin, original uh, organization. And we had, went through a couple of name changes. And then in 2004, we, we branched. And I decided that to continue to support both uh, we've, there are two different niches. Compassion and Choices is a very well-funded, very large, professionally uh, run and staffed organization that focuses on getting the laws passed, basically lobbying. Final Exit Network felt like, yes, but those laws leave out many, many, many people. And so the need to deal directly with people individually uh, still is there for those folks who are not able to access these laws for a number of reasons, which we can get into. So uh, Final Exit decided, and the original uh, founders decided that uh, we needed an organization to continue that original mission of Hemlock, and that's how we happened to be come, and come into existence. So that's a different flavor between those two organizations. Two different issues, I think they're both useful. Next slide. So, came back to the United States, and uh, I was kind of appalled, actually, at how we uh, gringos had uh, had designed this whole and, and, and monetized and, and organized uh, dying in our country. And when, when I was born in 1940, uh, Eighty percent of the people died at home. Um, it was a family uh, event, basically. It was a religious event many times, but it certainly wasn't a, a monetized commercial operation in those days. And uh, but today, um, it's almost a it's a mirror image. About eighty percent of the people die in institutions that have a, uh, a vested interest in not necessarily um, helping us to have a quick, dignified, peaceful, painless passing. Other people's interests, and some of them are economic, frankly, financial. So uh, uh, the Stanford, uh, my old alma mater, uh, uh, a medical school, uh, provided us this, this information that look at that poor fellow over there and the, on the slide uh, hooked up to all the tubes and stuff. That's that's more common than uh, the alternative that we're advocating here, unfortunately. And I don't call that dignified. I don't call that uh, uh, by choice even. Our choices become very hard to defend for many reasons we'll get into. Okay, next slide. So, again, it should have beauty, it should be with respect and care. How do we get that to happen? It doesn't happen automatically here, unfortunately. Uh, next slide. Okay, comes down to the first question, whose life is this? How do, who gets to choose? I was testifying in front of the uh, legislature here in Minnesota, uh, along with Compassion and Choices, um, in favor of getting us a death with dignity law passed here. Didn't happen yet. We're still working on it. But uh, after I had uh, done this kind of thing that I'm doing with you, promoting this and, and showing some passion and, and trying to get people to uh, address this issue, uh, another uh, fellow stood up and he said, 
we physicians are not murderers, and this is a slippery slope that would lead to, you know, uh, 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 lots of confidence in, in our um, care of our uh, patients. And I looked at him, I said, God, that's my cardiologist. <laughs> and it was. My cardiologist was up there contradicting everything I said. And uh, ironically, I've got a, uh, you know, a, a pacemaker and defibrillator here, and I've got to have him uh, help me turn it off if I get to the point where I want to exercise my choice. So this slide, I love this slide because it shows, you know, the, the, the usual three suspects who oppose what we're talking about here. Um, the politician, um, uh, the medical establishment that has their interests, which are not ours, and in many cases, the uh, 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 religious institutions, especially the Catholic Church. And it turns out that my cardiologist told me when we talked about it, I didn't change cardiologists. I bring it up every time I see him. And he, he kind of he kind of uh, uh, is tired of me bringing this up. But he said, finally, I will turn off your defib device. And if I can't, I'll find a colleague whose Catholic morals will not prevent him from doing so. Mm. Mm. Any uh, questions or comments that I, uh, I don't want to do this monologue any longer. Any uh, uh, comments that you folks would like to make at this point or questions? Based on, basically on the right to choose, I think, is the theme that we're up to at this point. Looks like somebody's got a hand up. I can't read your name. Who is it? Can you see Jim? Uh, who is it? Okay. I don't Still actually see iPad. someone with the, oh, and, oh, I don't think I see anyone with the hand up. Well, there's a little picture on, on, on uh, the video there. And, and whoever you are, you have your mic turned off. You're muted. I don't think, no, I think, okay. no, okay. yeah, but that's a good tactic, Gary. I mean, I even thought like, did I put my hand up? Maybe I have a question. Sure. Okay, <laughs> hands up. Well, let's, let's continue forward um, with the slides. Uh, Gallup has been tracking, Gallup polls have been tracking this since, uh, gosh, I can't read that very well, 40, 1942. How many would, people would agree with us? that uh, if uh, you are facing uh, a terminal situation, there's no hope for uh, recovery, and you're uh, suffering according to your own terms, should you have the right for physicians to, to help you speed that process and do it gently? Well, it's been uh, over 70% for years now. So everybody, in, even uh, studies, uh, surveys of, of Catholics, not the Catholic hierarchy, but the Catholics themselves agree about this same level. So uh, what's wrong with this picture? If the people are in favor of this, why are, uh, don't we have this right in all states? So that to me is a, a very interesting question. And it's one that requires, you know, a lot of work on our part to get it to happen. Next slide. Here are the states now where uh, some form of, they call it uh, physician aid in dying some places. Uh, there are 10 of them, 10 jurisdictions counting um, uh, wa uh, Washington, DC. And that covers about 20% of the US population now. And that, that uh, uh, the way I look at it, the glass not even has half full yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. And Arizona's not on that list, are you? No. No. No, not yet. Mm -mm. Um, but do you folks have an effort underway in your state? I could look that up. But uh, it might be worth uh, 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 something through your uh, uh, Baja 4 initiative to get behind that and support the people who are advocating for this in your own state. Next slide. Okay, now here's an interesting story. Doctors are insiders. And uh, 
I guess I was in New Mexico, and I brought the slide and talked about it. And finally, a, a, a doctor stood up and objected, but I'll tell you why. Um, again, another study from Stanford Medical School. They surveyed about 1,100 physicians and asked them if you were facing, you know, this uh, uh, suffering at the end of your life and there was no hope for recovery, uh, how would you want to die? And it's really interesting what the statistics say. That's on the next slide. They would not want any of the stuff that we are subjected to routinely. No CPR, no uh, ventilation, no di uh, dialysis, not even antibiotics. But when you get to the pain meds to control the palliative care, bam, it shoots up to the top again. So all the doctors really want, and they know what goes on in these uh, uh, medical facilities for uh, uh, people like us who are going to be patients there. Uh, they want none of this stuff. And so I brought that up and the doctor stood up and said, it's not our fault, we're employees. We have to follow the protocols of the, of the uh, uh, institutions we work for. And we wouldn't want it for ourselves, but we can't do anything but follow the protocol. So uh, uh, to me, that's, that, that's, that, that was very telling. Then when I looked at statistics about how uh, uh, doctors, you know, what they write in their own advanced directives and, and so on, and uh, doctors enter um, hospice care sooner and uh, make much more use of palliative care than the, than the rest of us. So why not us, huh? I see Tina shaking her head yes. Tina, as a hospice uh, chaplain, um, do you have any uh, 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 light to shine on this, this point? Of when should we go to hospice, huh? And uh, how should we get that to happen? You need to uh, uh, unmute yourself if, if, I, if I've twisted your arm enough. To Sorry, um, I couldn't find the way to unmute, but I figured a way out. Yes, um, yes, we don't use it soon enough. And I think for a lot of people, it means you're giving up, you or your loved one is being, you know, written off. Um, and, you know, so often we have people graduate, we have, you know, who, we have people who, um, decide to go and get treatment and they can come back again. You know, you can leave and come back. You can, um, but I think the doctors understand that if, if they have a, an illness that's terminal, that treatment really won't help. You can live better and longer. Mm -hmm. I see this over and over and over again with our patients. And as I say, we often kick them off because they live a lot longer than they would have if they'd been doing the treatments. Yeah. The, so the, the science bears you out on that. It's really mm -hmm. proven. Yeah. The science and anecdotally, I've seen it. And um, and so, yeah, there's um, in my time, I've been doing this nine years. Uh, we go to Douglas, which is primarily um, Latin, Latinx, uh, has a lot of Latinx anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And at first, people did not want to use hospice because they thought it meant they were killing their loved one. Uh, their family member, their whatever. But now it's really more and more people realize this is giving me extra help and helping the person live better. So yeah, fantastic. Uh, this line, uh, this uh, CPR line here is interesting. I was at a conference and an, an uh, elderly lady. I guess I, I'm elderly too, but she uh, she called. Uh, we were out in the hall, and she she said, "I want to show you something." And she started to unbutton her blouse. And I thought, oh my, <laughs> what's going on here? And uh, she showed me that she had a huge tattoo, green tattoo on her chest that C, uh, uh, no CPR, you know, no, no resuscitation, no CPR. And uh, our lawyer happened to be nearby. And I said, uh, Rob, come over and take a look at this. And, and I said, is this going to... Um, be considered valid if she has to go into the hospital. And he said, no, it does not. They take the stance that it could have been done on a dare. 
uh, who knows how long ago it was, uh, all kinds of reasons why it wouldn't work. You really do need to have an advanced directive for starters to make sure that your wishes with regard to CPR or any of these uh, treatments uh, are documented. I thought it was cute, but it didn't work for her. Anyway, next uh, slide. Gary, can I say one thing here too? Sure. Your resources on the FEN website include a list of videos that are all available, almost all of them online. And a number of congregants and I have watched some of those and we're offering to watch those coming months. But we were struck by the number of people featured in those videos who were nurses or doctors mm -hmm. that chose to have their death filmed by their loved ones um, almost as a medical statement. Yes. Because of the graph you just showed that doctors themselves were like, let me show you a different way. And the only way I can show you is with my own death. Yes. I actually can't even show you in another way. I can only show you um, by having my, my daughter film me dying right now. Um, and we were struck. We were really struck by that. There's another resource if you're really interested. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's according to our theme here, Good Death, uh, the Good Death Society blog. But I want to put that in the uh, chat. Uh, it's a it's a pro, it's a um, um, project, a Final Exit Network, but it's much much broader. It, it includes virtually any aspect of this whole death with dying and death with dignity and death with uh, um, uh, right to die um, that you want to know about. They're they're short. They're very well vetted and well written. Uh, by uh, people who know what they're doing, experts often. Uh, and there's an archive uh, uh, organized by topics. So any aspect of this that you'd like to learn more about, that's a real reader uh, friendly way to find out to get into this. The Good Death Society blog. Okay. So why are so many people left out of these death or dignity laws? Um, you know, uh, this slide kind of leads into that, that uh, doctors in states where there's no uh, physician aid in dying can't do anything for us, but they can keep us, you know, in that deathbed suffering as long as uh, it, it pays, so to speak. <laughs> uh, next slide. Here are some of the reasons why millions of people in this country uh, aren't able to use these laws even if they exist in their states. They might be physically uh, unable to do the procedures themselves that are required by all these laws. These laws are all based on the, the first law that came into being in Oregon 22 years ago now, and that requires uh, it's, it's not euthanasia, there's no help involved. You have to do it yourself to ingest uh, a kind of a cocktail of, uh, uh, of medicines, chemicals. Uh, and some people, because of these medical conditions are physically not able to do that. And the biggest thing, on, it's not on the list here. Yes, it is, dementia. Dementia is, is uh, just a rapidly growing issue in our country. And the laws say that if you're not uh, legally mentally competent, too bad. This, these laws cannot help you. And so uh, this is, uh, these are the reasons why we feel so strongly we ought to continue to work with people and their loved ones directly, rather than saying, oh, you got a law now, uh, our work is done. That's not true, okay? Next slide. So, like good Boy Scouts, you know, we really need to be prepared. We need to do our, uh, our planning. And I hope that your group, your organization, will try to get people in all four of your churches to uh, do their end of life planning. That would be a wonderful uh, gift to them. That includes what used to be called the Living Well, Vance Directive. Uh, health care power of attorney, which nowadays I think is usually called uh, uh, health care surrogate. 
um, and things like what you want done with your uh, remains and uh, your funeral arrangements and uh, and all those things together under one umbrella. So um, you not only need to document very, very clearly what you want, what you don't want, you need to explain why. And I think that you need to make sure that the uh, people who are important to you understand that and if possible, support you on it. My kids do and my grandkids. Uh, but this is such an open thing in our, in our family that uh, I know that if, it, if, if one of them happened to be the one to uh, be advocating for me on my deathbed, they know exactly where I'm coming from and why. So I hope you, you uh, um, consider getting your advanced directive not only written, but updated every once in a while. Things change. Uh, next slide. So what we're doing now is, you know, we're educating ourselves on this whole topic. I would recommend reading the books, uh, visiting the uh, blog post and reading a few of those, visiting a, a Final Exit Network uh, website. There are a lot of resources on there that are free. Everything we do is free, by the way. All of our presentations, all of our research, everything is done uh, pro bono through the uh, donations of our uh, people who aren't able to do that stuff themselves, they, they uh, help us uh, do what we do. Um, and medical spiritual <laughs> advisors. We're talking about, we're talking about our, our colleagues and our ministers and our, uh, our own doctors, um, because this is not only a medical matter. I believe this is an existential uh, matter. And uh, working through that and, and gaining uh, a level of comfort. So you're not only able to uh, make your choices wisely and communicate them to others clearly and comfortably and defend them when you have to, uh, this requires advice and input from others. Uh, and uh, let's not put off any longer our uh, advanced directives uh, if we don't have them and, uh, updated. Um, and to, you know, be sure to discuss it uh, periodically with your family. I have a friend who says, don't worry. Uh, talking about uh, birth control won't make you pregnant. And talking about, you know, Dying won't make you dead, so let's do it. Let's talk about it. Bring it out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, that, that was another great point of some of the videos on your website, too, is just clearly how different it was for people who started early telling their kids, like before yeah. they were terminally ill or in pain, I need you to know this. I'm thinking about this. Let's talk about it. And the difference those families had versus saying it later in the game and having to deal with the reactions when, you know, it was just a real marked difference for families. Absolutely. And even if somebody doesn't agree with you, if they know what you want and where it's coming from and why, they're likely to go ahead and support you. Uh, uh, talking with the family re reminds me of a really funny cartoon, adult cartoon book done by a New Yorker cartoonist. The title is, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And the whole thing is, is hilarious cartoons of this couple trying to get their parents to uh, have the talk with them. And how, I, I, how many ways uh, they found to passively uh, avoid doing that. It's a fun book. Uh, can't we talk about something more pleasant if you're interested? Let's uh, see the next slide. Okay, there are several uh, freebies. If, if you are a member of Final Exit Network or if you take advantage of the offer for free membership that uh, is available to you as participants on this uh, show, uh, you get uh, a free um, use of the US uh, Living Will Registry. And um, this is online. 
you can have your advanced directive uploaded and that's kept there and you can update it anytime you wish and it's there in case you happen to be out in aspen and hit a tree or something and you go to the hospital you don't have your advanced directive with you it can be downloaded by the hospital uh, and uh, put into their own system their own medical system my wife Anne, two years ago was in uh, intensive care for uh, two days because uh fall on uh, an ice here in Minnesota and had uh, traumatic brain injury. And we tested this, um, our, our FEN Living Will Registry, and, and the link worked. I had to make it happen. I had to go to the, to the nursing station and ask them to download it, but they did. And Anne then got her little DNR bracelet. Until that point, you know, they were just going to put her through the regular protocol. So it does work. And it's free in the sense that uh, the FIN membership, I think it's $50 for individual, $75 for a couple. Anyway, that's the same price uh, for the Living Well Registry on its own. So it's a twofer. So I encourage you, if you become a FIN member or are a FIN member, take advantage of that. We've tested it, I've tested it with my own wife and it works. Um, there are a couple other uh, benefits that we've added since then. Let's see the next slide. Maybe that'll get us to there. Okay, here's here's the, the punchline, of course. I, I like the eagles and uh, that sound of pe peaceful, easy uh, feeling. Uh, and I, it made me think about that, you know? That's where peace comes from, partially. Knowing that you're understood, you know, and that you're prepared, you're knowing that uh, um, you have made peace with your own existential reality that you're facing. Big sigh of relief and uh, reduces the stress, tension, trauma. Next slide. OK, getting to the advanced directive itself. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. But they still haven't done it. And I don't want to embarrass any of you, but if you're in that case, uh, please, please get the form. Each state has a slightly different form. It's free and it's downloadable from your own state. And then use it as a template to ask yourself uh, questions about what you want, what you don't want, under which circumstances. It's not hard to do. Uh, the first time it takes longer, but updating it is a lot easier. And it should be updated every couple of years at least. So, so that there's no pushback from uh, the medical institutions if it came to that. Uh, let's take the next slide because I think that gets us into the surrogate. Uh, usually, because we're medicated, uh, we may have uh, underlying medical conditions that don't make us at our most uh, articulate and assertive, right? We could become increasingly reliant and dependent on others. This is the person who's going to be there to defend your wishes. Extremely important that you choose the right kind of person who is knowledgeable. Well, first of all, is an expert on what you want and don't want and why. And secondly, it's a person who is assertive and knows enough about the, uh, how to do that in, in the hospital context or the hospice context, right? Uh, to be sure that uh, uh, your wishes, in fact, are being advocated for. Now, my wife is going to be for me if it comes to that, but a backup are my two daughters. And one of my daughters has worked in uh, uh, the, the Department of Public Health for years, and so she's kind of savvy on the medical stuff, and she happens to be the most assertive one, the most bossy one, we say. And she's the next in line because I want somebody there to really, you know, speak up, not be timid, and uh, intervene if necessary. Now you, you need a, uh, alternatives because somebody may be on vacation uh, you know, when it happens that you need them. And uh, uh, in some states, they ask you to notarize, but I believe in your state and in mine, simply need two, two witnesses. Once you've completed, photocopies count legally as originals. So you can make a number of them, put one in your glove compartment, uh, um, um, Take one with you to the hospital, um, 
make sure all uh, your uh, loved ones who are going to be involved in this have a copy. And it's a great uh, discussion device, too. They'll say, well, what do you mean by that, you know? My, my second daughter, she's the humorous one. She says, don't worry, uh, Daddy. If you get a bad cold, I'll pull the plug for you, you know? And I say, whoa, wait a minute. I, I do want somebody uh, to take this seriously. She says, don't worry. I understand. Let's uh, look at the next slide. The DNR, okay? It's also now called, it can be also called no code. In other words, they won't, uh, uh, in the hospital, they won't do a code on you to, to trigger uh, the resuscitation. Uh, it's not like it's in the uh, medical shows that people like to watch. You know, they go in there and put the paddles on and, you know, a week later, the, uh, the patient's out playing tennis. It doesn't work that way. Uh, a large percentage of people, especially our age, do not really uh, actually recover, recover much quality of life after that happens, especially with intubation as well. So uh, um, if you're really serious about this, then uh, it's important to specify that in your advanced directive and, and describe the circumstances where that would be your choice. Um, allow natural death is, is actually a positive way to write that up. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, lose the next slide. A pulse, a physicians or provider, sometimes they call it most medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. This is like a physician's prescription. It carries uh, force. Uh, it follows you. Uh, from you know the emergency room to the hospice to wherever you happen to be, and those are the instructions. If the medical facility says our morals, our our policies don't allow us to do this, then if they violate this, this is this is a legal uh, a document that they can be sued. There are suits now happening for something called wrongful life, if you can imagine. <laughs> it means that people. Wishes were ignored and pushed back on at, to the point where they were violated. And that is a criminal and a civil offense. We're just looking for some lawsuits to uh, make this point. Uh, so that's what a post is. And you don't want to do a post until uh, the end is really in sight. You know, usually they don't, they're not done. Uh, any uh, earlier than a, than a year before you know the terminal condition is is clearly in sight. Uh, you don't want to have this one um, too soon because uh, your your condition may not require it at that point. Next slide. Here's how you find out more about these different things. Uh, if you're into Facebook, we have two Facebook groups. And join us, make your comments, become a member of the Facebook group. And uh, I, LinkedIn, I'm, I'm not a Facebook person or a LinkedIn person, but those are different ways to join us and, and uh, make yourself uh, a part of the movement. And I think that might be a lot. No, yep, that's it. Comes down to my life, my death and my choice. So now the talking head is done. Let's have a good discussion about this. And just a reminder to everyone, I've got the recording on in case Gary gives us a gem. But if you want to say something that you don't want recorded, please, please <clears throat> message me or tell me. I'll turn it off. I'd kind of like to ask you what your reactions to this is and, and uh, where do you stand um, as a you, you on, on this right? So I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you seen done when you have uh, family members who do not want to honor your advanced directive? Good question. Often that is what we call a swooper. 
someone who sweeps in who hasn't been in contact for a few years the the, uh, the, the core family members have understood and are supportive mm -hmm. and this person says no 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 we can't we gotta do everything exactly they're they're loud and and, and assertive okay. sometimes unfortunately you know the medical staff uh, gives them too much attention mm -hmm. so uh, uh I don't see anybody in my particular family that would do that. But if you do, it would be important to address it earlier rather than later, you know, to say, here are my wishes. Here's a copy of my advanced directive. Uh, and uh, it's my life. I don't know if you feel comfortable about doing that, but having someone come in at the last minute uh, is a, a source for a lot of unnecessary um, even sometimes tragic uh, conflict. I think, um, and I don't know about the state of Arizona, but uh, I know in some places uh, in your advanced directive, it's possible to exclude family members from being uh -huh. allowed to have access to your medical information and allowed to be involved in decision-making. That's interesting, Don. Is, are you Don or you're Sally? I'm Sally, sorry. Sally. <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. I'm going to look into that. That's. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's true in my state, but that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be most important. Had my brother still been alive and in one of his manic bipolar states, uh -huh. I would have wanted to have him excluded from my final wishes very clearly. And also I have some pretty basic religious relatives that in their sanity and in their belief would not be reticent to be there and be involved. And I hadn't thought about excluding them or asking my family not to notify them that's a, it. You raise a. You touch a, a, something very personal with me. When I was a uh, a teenager, I was a rabid. You can't believe this, but I was a rabid fundamentalist, uh, standing on corners, has, passing out. Uh, you too. Uh -huh. So my relatives, my wife's side of the family, are still very, very much that way. And uh, God forbid uh, that uh, they should be involved in in, in this. Um, that's a really good point. Now, I do see it possibly as a, uh, when I was out for my sister's funeral, it was like going back, you know, 50 years uh, and in the deep south, Louisiana. And uh, at the funeral, I was getting uh, the usual uh, fundamentalist um, interactions going. And I, I tried to get it to be an opportunity for me to explain a little bit about how my my spiritual journey has changed over the years, too. but uh, didn't get very far with that, frankly. But uh, it is an opportunity, Phil, to bring up these interesting questions um, and help people, you know, get out of their uh, original frame of, of, of thinking a little bit, at least to respect yours. Yeah. Um, yeah, hi, uh, this is Sue in Tucson. Uh, uh, are you in Tucson also? No, I'm in, in South St. Paul. Minnesota. Okay, sorry, um, I, I um, got in late to your, um, to this, um, uh, and I'm, I just got, got out of a funeral, so that's why I'm all in my funeral, oh, interesting. Place, funnily enough. <laughs> anyway, um, I have, I have a couple of friends in their early 90s who, um, committed suicide two years ago together and um do you know how many how long um um what notice they gave to their four grown children 30 years hmm. they were the kids were brought up they're all atheists the kids were brought up knowing that at some point their parents were going to do this together so it was part of the growing up process for the kids, knowing that this would occur, and it did. So I take my hat off to them all um, for sharing that between them. 
Um, and then I then I have a question. What is the difference between um, choice and dignity and um, uh, death with dignity? Because um, uh, John Abraham is um, not so much a friend of mine, but somebody that I know and I mm -hmm. um, have his book. And um, he, as, as you say, he lives in Tucson. But I think he used to be with um, Death with Dignity or, or Final Exit Network or, John, you know, John, John Abraham. Yeah, I know him quite well. John is still a member of Final Exit Network, I believe. Uh, he was one of our speakers. I, I run a, uh, a speakers bureau, about 20 speakers. He was one of our most active ones. Um, but uh, he now do, focuses mostly on the workshops that he does there in, in the Tucson area. I think it's Tucson, right? Tucson. Yeah. Um, but uh, I like I like John, and I think he would be a good resource for your next uh, um, meeting of this type. Uh, you bring up uh, 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 something. This whole word suicide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The oh, first of all, if you look on our, our Final Exit Network, uh, um, all of our platforms, the the website, the the uh, uh, Good Death Society blog, the, the, the uh, Facebook pages everywhere, right up front, we said we do not promote or support suicide. We do not assist suicide. And, we, and, and, uh, we, uh, uh, and if you are thinking about suicide, please call this suicide hotline. Yeah. Well, yeah, we my mistake. I, I understand and I agree with you. We educate, we pe give people real information about all of their options, underline the word all, including that one. And the euphemism of self-delivery or self-deliverance, um, I don't believe too much in, in, in those fuzzy words, but that ha has sort of become a way to distinguish between rational choice at the end of your life and some emotional or mental illness kind of issue when it's unwarranted. We have a medical committee, uh, MDs, uh, psychiatrists, uh, uh, social medical social workers who evaluate every request that comes in to final exit network to, for people considering uh, what we call exit guide services. This was our signature services we did from the early 80s where uh, we will provide people with information they need in order to uh, seek their own self-deliverance on their own terms at the, and on, at the, on their own time. They don't have to meet the uh, requirements of the law. But we uh, uh, want to be sure that only people who are qualified in terms of having a bona fide uh, 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 requirement you know, uh, uh, to be suffering and to have an uh, uh, irremedial kind of condition and so on. We don't want some young lady whose boyfriend, Jill DeJure, and she wants to, you know, um, take this drastic step. So we screen people carefully. We also have a cadre of uh, counselors on the phone that interview people and give them lots and lots of uh, airtime hundreds of hours of airtime that these people have over the telephone. Uh, and most of those people are given information that leads them to other resources and other options. And only a few of them actually are those that really need to do a final exit. So we're not a suicide organization. You, can't, you kind of triggered me there. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually, I want to highlight that at Mountain Vista, we had someone work with Final Exit Network, um, Martha Castriata and Larry Castriata. Um, Martha had a Final Exit Guide and a guide was working with them. And I don't know how I'm, this is part of the experience that um, they really brought. One of the reasons we're doing this series and we were inspired by the series is Martha's death and her choice to die. And some of the ways our congregation has been thinking about it since. So I know that the, having the guide was a huge help, but I also know they went through all the steps you just described. They had to submit medical records and talk to people before a guide was brought in to help them think about what their next steps were. Yeah, the guide, the guides, they were wonderful. I had to go through that training in order to join the board. I've been on the board since 2015. And the first step is you can't join the board unless you know what an exit guide is all about and what they do. 
and I'm more of a blah blah person. I, I but these other guys, gosh, I just take my hat off on how compassionate, and they are there with the person to provide a presence. No one should die alone. Anybody who is taking such a step really needs, you know, moral support and, and love, basically. And these guys are just amazing people. Uh, this brings up another um, uh, topic in a way. I, I mentioned that we have two, two more uh, new services. And these are, uh, the, the guide service, of course, is also free. Uh, but these two new services are, as well, um, we have developed, we brought together a team of uh, medical ethicists, lawyers, um, doctors, others, to design an advanced directive for dementia. If people are fairly early on the process of dementia, this is a supplement that you can attach. We, we, we make it free of charge. You attach it to your uh, uh, advanced directive. And then if you get into a facility, Tina, they get in a facility where they push back and won't do that because now she looks perfectly happy. You know, when she's sitting there uh, uh, like a vegetable and you put a, a spoon in front of her mouth and her mouth comes open, obviously she's okay. We can keep her longer. And so to avoid that terrible kind of scenario, we develop this and it comes again free with a lawyer, if they get pushed back and, and the medical institution won't uh, 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 honor this uh, advanced directive for dementia, uh, our lawyer will give them a call. And if it leads to that, it could lead to a lawsuit. So we were very, very serious about giving people who have Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementia the, the same right once they're past that window of opportunity. Tina, do you see situations like that? that uh, it would be helpful to, you know, ha ha have some uh, something with a little bit of teeth in it for for these uh, patients. I don't know. It's tricky. <laughs> Excuse me. My mother had a DNR and everything all set up. She had vascular dementia, and so near the closer she got to the end, she would say, "No, I don't want to go." Huh. Okay. She changed her. You know, she undid her DNR. Hmm. because I don't think she quite understood what it meant anymore Boy. but that's tricky you know and in the end we had to make a decision to not do anything heroic but it was hard because we knew she wanted to still be there interesting interesting well it's really hard you know having to keep in mind okay when they were more the way they used to be they thought they wanted a DNR but yeah it's tough I hadn't, I hadn't heard it happens that way I, I seen many cases where it happens the other way, you know, that now uh, they seem perfectly happy watching daytime TV and sitting there all day. Uh, what makes you think that they don't want like this existence or wouldn't want it? Yeah. 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 No. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a free service. Another service we've just developed. We've hired a, well, uh, contracted with a professional um, consultant for surrogates, for people who may not have anybody appropriate they trust to be a surrogate, to train that surrogate, uh, or coach an existing surrogate on how to best deal with the uh, situation when it occurs. Again, free of charge. And uh, uh, Althea, our, 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 she's really, really good, uh, both as a person and as a um, uh, very, very qualified and effective uh, consultant for surrogates. So that's one more benefit that FEM members can get free of charge. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that will uh, be helpful in cases where people don't have anybody that they could really feel comfortable about making that kind of a, a trusted relationship with. Uh, and uh, Tina, you also brought up another memory here. Uh, my uh, wife's sister, Marty, younger than she is, was, uh, was a uh, technical rock climber, head uh, uh, mountain rescue teams, 
uh, uh, headed um, uh, rescue teams that went down into caves to rescue people who got lost in there. She mapped caves. She was a aggressive uh, downhill cross country skier. Uh, just a tremendously strong woman. And her decision was, I want to experience this last adventure to the end. I want to know what it's like. And it took a long time because she was in, she, she died of cancer. And, but it took a long, long time. And she was in a hospice, wonderful hospice. But that was her choice. So I would call that a good death. You know, you have to raise the question, who chooses, right? And so even in that case, it's not a thing I would choose. But if, if it's her choice, I, I, we, we supported her fully in that choice. Um, okay. Uh, Mary. Can I see a, a show of hands? <laughs> How many people have advanced directives? All right, we're preaching to the choir. Well, Sue. <laughs> I mean, Sue and Phil, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, we would certainly recommend that strongly. Oh, look at, there it is. Okay, wonderful. Bill. I carry that card on the top of my other cards in my billfold, uh -huh. just in case a loved one's not with me. Uh -huh. And it, I, uh, my wife died, it took six weeks from the beginning of the process until the end. And she was from one service to another in the medical facility uh -huh. to other. And that card bypassed waiting for directives to come from the office to go up to the nursing station. I'd simply give the card when they took her in ICU and I say, please call this number your fax will start within 30 seconds Wow! and you'll have everything. I think there's a state of Arizona card, perhaps, that's free like that. I mm -hmm. pay a service because my attorney, when I set up, when we set up our trust, suggested that. I'm sure it's a financial benefit to him, but carrying a card that, that does it very quickly it's always with you. So, so important with the way we travel these days. Well, that worked with Anne, as I mentioned. Yeah, important. Well, you mentioned attorney. Brings up another uh, thought here. Uh, a UU friend of mine, attorney in Colorado, uh, uh, was having an onset of dementia. He was a final exit member. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, had seen the uh, supplemental advanced directive uh, device that we, we were just developing then. And he and his wife used that for his passing. And uh, the only method that is legal, even in Colorado, where they have the death of dignity law for that kind of situation is VSAD, voluntary stopping, eating, and drinking. And uh, if that's handled uh, properly, uh, it can be a fairly reasonable way to, to go. Uh, not too painful, but, it to, but there's, there's some medical expertise that needs to be applied to that. Uh, and that was what has to be used if, there, if there's the dementia issue going on. And he, I asked his wife later, dear, also a dear friend, how did it go? And, she said, well, the only complaint that he had was on the fifth day. And he said, honey, can I have a beer? <laughs> she said, no, sweetheart, <laughs> no beer. And, uh, but uh, it went relatively smoothly. She still hasn't shared the emotional part of that experience. But um, Tina, uh, in, in, have you uh, seen VSED being used in, in hospices? Um, well, I've had at least two experiences with it, not so much in hospices. Um, a friend of mine's mother was in hospice uh -huh. and she was in pretty good shape in her early 90s. And 
um, had had a talk with her minister about it and decided to do it without consulting with her daughter, who was a minister at Christmas time. Hmm. You know, so that was not exact, but you know, it, it, it went, it took longer than this woman expected because even though she was 92, so she got annoyed that it took so long, uh, but you know, I think it was relatively good death. And then I had a parishioner ask me, you know, how, who had a lot of neurological issues and really low quality of life. And he asked, you know, well, what can I do to end this? And I said, in this state, and I, the only thing you can do is stop eating and drinking. And Eventually he did do that. He ended up in a nursing home and he did that. And I, I said to his wife, I'm really sorry. I hope I didn't, you know, cause this, but she said he was so happy to have some control over his life again. That's a big, big issue. And he had a little bit of dementia caused by this sort of Parkinsonian thing, but yeah, it actually was um, very good for both of them that he could make this decision and he could. A uh, big, uh, you know, when they passed the law, uh, uh, in Oregon, originally, the legislature required them to do a survey every year about people who were using this law and issues surrounding how they feel about dying, you know? And their number one uh, complaint, I guess you'd say, was not fear of death, was not pain and suffering, was not the huge expenses involved, but it was a loss of personal autonomy. That's the number, and it's been consistent over the years. As you said, people really uh, want to feel that uh, they have um, agency, right? Now. I, can I jump in real quick? I think, Mary, have you been trying to, to jump in? Is there something you'd like to add? Well, I, there were two things. Um, if you already have an advanced directive, would you need an advanced directive for dementia as an add-on? Uh, I would say, it, yes, it, A, it doesn't hurt, and B, uh, 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 standard uh, uh, forms that I've seen in many different states do not, uh, uh, they exclude dementia. I'll have to look. A lot. Yeah, so I think, yes, that would be a very good thing to do. You can go online to the uh, our website and uh, uh, click on, uh, uh, services. It'll take you right to that form. You can look it over. And if you need uh, help uh, uh, doing, uh, you know, putting it together, um, our, our lawyer probably would be happy to, you know, look at it for you when you've done that. I also had um, an anecdotal experience. In 1997, way back in Massachusetts, my mother had had a stroke and she probably had some dementia. Mm -hmm. And she decided she would not eat or drink. She was in the hospital at the time. And the doctor informed me that if she didn't start eating, he was going to commit her to a mental institution and force feed her. Whoa, man. The nurses, and this is in very Catholic Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The nurses were wonderful at getting me help and getting my mother out of the hospital and into her own home and into hospice care. My sister lived a few doors away and she's a nurse. And my mother, I don't know how she did it, but she remained lucid for a long time. We could sing to her. I could change my mother's diapers the way she used to change mine. <laughs> and it was a gift. Wonderful. But that was a long time ago. Um, and my husband recently died of dementia in a uh, an extended care facility, well, it wasn't an extended care facility, in a, in a uh, dementia facility mm. with very bad protocol during COVID. Mm. He mm. died also in um, hospice. But um, it's interesting that you would need a second um, advanced directive. Well, uh, Mary, it's not really an advanced directive, it's a supplement, a legal document that is attached, you know, uh, to your own advanced directive. That says if I'm crazy, I still want that to happen? Yeah, yeah, if, if you, you know, you don't have enough marbles to play the game. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Tina, um, I, uh, I understand 
that we it's very important to know that hospice is not just an institution that you go to it can be but it can also be done at home can you say a little bit about that well in my county um it can only be done at home or in a nursing home or an assisted you know we go into all of them but we don't have an inpatient facility here in cochise county which is a pretty big county but only has about 140,000 people um, and so yeah you have to either so hospice goes into people's houses when they have a diagnosis of six months or less to live um and then you know, we have these periodic reviews we do of people. And if somebody is doing really well and seems to have more than six months, we kick them off, which is great, you know, but they miss the support, they miss the services. So, and of course they can always come back on eventually. It's kind of sad when they do, but um, yeah, really, I first experienced hospice with my father when I was 25, he was 65. And then my brother, when he was 57, were both in hospice. and. You know, I'm not medical and it just meant so much to me to be able to have the support to help take care of them at home. They could be at home, you know, that was kind of miraculous, hard, but amazing. And um, so that's why I wanted to work as a hospice chaplain when I got the ability to help other families go through this at home and as well as possible. That's as good as it gets, really. I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, do you have any help or guidance or suggestions on how to be a caretaker during this process? Because I think they suffer a great deal emotionally uh, dealing with this. And is there any way you can lessen their trauma? Well, our uh, surrogate consultant, uh, Actually, uh, she gave a, a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Maybe I can get you a link to that if, if, if you folks want, just uh, uh, recently. And she's, she brings this up and she says, it's really important uh, that the, not only the surrogate that you choose, but other caretakers have caretakers for themselves, that they have a breaks from this, that they have, uh, 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 spiritual or, or psychological support if they feel like they need it, if they get into some issue that they themselves aren't sure of, um, they have resources themselves. It's like, it's like a two-tier approach. Your caretakers also need to have uh, planned in advance how they're going to take care of themselves. That's what she said, essentially. Uh, boy, the ones I admire again are the, are the exit guys. They do this all the time, sitting with people by their sides uh, um, who, who are dying. And, and they almost, I would say uniformly say, is really a, uh, an amazing, grace-filled uh, uh, privilege. So there's that on the plus side. It takes a lot, but it also gives a lot. Um, we were talking about visas. Brand new book just came out by experts in the field. Uh, the title is "Visa: um, A Peaceful Way uh, of." Um, uh, I don't know the rest of the title. It's done by Dr. Tim Quill, who is really one of the experts on palliative care generally in the United States. And uh, another editor is a friend of mine. Uh, a leading um, um, PhD um, uh, a lawyer who whose entire career is focused on the uh, moral and ethical dimensions of what we've been talking about. His name is Thaddeus Pope. And if you're really interested in that, there's no better resource. It's brand new, it's just out. Can we have the title and the author? Well, uh, you can find it by Googling uh, book, uh, a voluntary uh, uh, stopping eating and drinking, or maybe V said. Just V said. The editors it comes are up uh, Dr. Timothy Quill and. U I W L. Yes, and Dr. Uh, Thaddeus Pope, P O P E. I'm sure that would get it. I'm sure it's available on Amazon. 
Thank you. Well, I'll just one more thing for folks in Mountain Vista tomorrow during fellowship hour. We're going to offer a small group breakout room hosted by Joe and Alma, Scott and Bill Killian, um, watching a 16 minute video called Rosemary Bowen's Fast, which is about a process of voluntary cessation of eating and drinking. Um, so that'll actually happen tomorrow at fellowship hour. It's an optional, so you don't have to do it. Um, but it's another opportunity coming up to watch something and, and talk with other Mountain Vista folks. Of course, it's open, but I would not dare steal anyone from their own fellowship hour. Well, talking about death, you know, I think we overcame the, the taboo about it, right? No problem for us. But do I think we uh, need to model that kind of uh, uh, communication with others a lot. Um, two thoughts on that. One is, uh, I, there was a book that influenced me a lot back in the 80s. Uh, called um, uh, The Yaki Way of Wisdom, Carlos Castaneda. I don't know if you read it back in the day, but the idea of the teachings of uh, Don Juan, his, his shamanistic uh, mentor, uh, came down to uh, having death ride on your left shoulder. That's how he wrote that. That's the way he, he described it to to his uh, um, uh, student. And the idea is that being aware of our mortality can bring a lot of zest to life. It, 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 it makes you aware that uh, you should be, you know, carping the diem, as the Romans told us, right? Seize the, seize the day. Uh, and uh, it ain't over till it's over, and you're only dying, you know, you're not dead until you're dead, and you should be able to live fully to the last moment. My goal, my personal goal, is what they call compressed morbidity. I want to live a full, continue to live a full, zestful life, and then drop off the cliff at the end fast and quick and easy. <laughs> um, and that's kind of one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing what I do. Well, thank you so much, folks, for uh, giving us this opportunity to think and share yeah. together. And uh, it's been great fun for me. Um, I am a little um, flippant sometimes. I, that's just my nature. And um, but death for me is, is deadly, but not necessarily serious all the time. 